afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, winter, se winter semester starts today. I want to first thank our sponsors for this week's class. Jeff and Lori Golchin are sponsoring in honor of the yard site of Jeff's father, Charles Golchin, Yitzchak Ben Zelig. He should have his neshama should go higher and higher in the heavenly worlds. And should have lots of nachas from you and from the entire family, from all the children, all the grandchildren. You're very welcome. If anyone's interested in sponsoring any of the classes in the future, uh, there's a website you can go to, chabadkaneo.com slash sponsor, or you call Jacob or mention to Jacob, the fellow sitting to my left, uh, and he'll take care of it. You'll tell them the week and the occasion for the sponsorship. Uh, I welcome all of you that are here live. It's good to see our faces, the live faces growing. Week by week, we're starting to see some of those from years ago coming back. And we do welcome all of our Zoom friends. Nice to see your face, too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That's very sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a th a welcome to our Zoom audience, to our Facebook audience, and to our YouTube audience. If any of you out there in the uh, universe live in the area, we also welcome you to, in the future, come back, join us in person. We'd love to see you. And the bonus, besides for the fact that you're going to be socializing and seeing human beings rather than screens, is that we do serve lunch here after class and you'll be able to participate. While if you're home watching on Zoom, we will not be delivering lunch to your home. We are studying the book of Deuteronomy. And literally, What's interesting, I believe I, I, on the calendar two days ago, I think it was, that is the actual anniversary of when Moses gave this speech. Because he started, I believe it's 39 days before he passed away. That's when Moses gave this, this talk of the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy is really made up of three long speeches over this period of time. One of those speeches we're going to conclude today the second speech we're going to begin today, and that second speech, hi Jack, welcome. The second speech will go on for quite a few chapters, um, and it will take us quite a few years to go through his speech. So Moses did it in 39 days. We'll try a few years, but we will get to it. But the book of Deuteronomy is this powerful plea from Moses to the future generations, that's as if he's speaking to us today, as to what is the importance of there being this chosen nation, and what is our mission statement? What are we supposed to do? How are we to act? How are we to behave? And it touches literally on every single part of, of Jewish life. I want to back up to the end of the last class we did, which was a number of weeks ago, and just start off from that theme, and then we'll go on forwards. And I gave this parable of a king. And the king was also a wonderful artist. He knew how to draw very, very well. He loved art. He had a prince that was being groomed to become the king, the next king. But he also wanted his son to enjoy art, to love art, to be good at art. And his son actually told his father he would love to learn it. So his father brought one of the great artists in his kingdom and he said, your project, your job, is to teach the prince how to be an artist, like his father. And after a session, the artist came back to the king and said, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be able to fulfill the task you gave me. In fact, I have bad news for you. Your son will never be an artist because your son is colorblind. And therefore, he will never be able to distinguish between the colors and never be able to figure out exactly how to put that painting together. And the king was devastated. He knows how much art meant to him, and he wanted it to mean that much to his son as well. His son was devastated because he also wanted to be an artist, just like his father. And the king thinks, you know, I'm the king. And so what if this artist said he can't do it? I'm sure somewhere in this kingdom I'm going to find someone that will take on this task and take on this mission and turn my son into an artist. So he puts out the word. He puts out an ad on Instagram and on Facebook, every place he possibly can, wanted. I'm looking for someone who can teach my son, the prince, 
to become a great artist even though he's colorblind. Artists look at this and say, it's not possible. You can't. I mean, you can't be a great artist if, if you don't have a feel for color, if you can't appreciate the differences and the nuances of each color, of each shade of color. But one guy takes the job, and he says, let me give it a, a, a go. And he takes the prints into his studio, and they work for day in, day out. They continue to work and to work and to work. He keeps sending notes to the king of progress. It's going well, it's going well, and it's going well. And finally, after months of this, he sends word to the king, your son is now an artist. And what I would like you to do is schedule an evening where all of the king's advisors and their families come together and you make a ball out of it, a dinner, and we'll have a canvas there, and your son, the prince, will get up and he will draw before this audience a magnificent painting. You can imagine the king is so filled with nachas, he's so happy, he's so joyful, and he sends out the royal invitations to the hand-select people that should be there for this evening, gets the finest of caterers, the finest of foods, the music, everything is there, and on the stage is this blank canvas. And at some point, the highlight of the evening, the prince comes up on stage, and he begins. And at first, it doesn't make much sense. They just see him taking a brush and putting one color and then another color, and another color, and another color. Somehow he's getting beyond this colorblind handicap, but it's still just colors. And as he continues, it begins coming together. And indeed, this magnificent piece of work, this magnificent piece of art comes out of this. The audience goes wild, standing ovation. And then the prince turns to his audience and thanks the audience and thanks his teacher and thanks the king. And he says, I'd like to welcome you back tomorrow night to do this again. He loved it. He was having such a good time. And so the next night, same thing, dinner, music, the art, he gets up, color gets put on, and again, magnificent piece. This continues day in, day out. He's drawing away beautiful, beautiful pieces. The king is so proud, he's hanging up his pieces all throughout the palace. What was the trick? How did this teacher do it? The teacher came up with the concept that we as children often purchased, and that was paint by number. <laughs> so in this very light shade that the people in the room couldn't see, but only the person standing in front of the canvas, he had these very light lines drawn with a number. And the number was connected to a different color of the paint. So if it said 15, he went to can 15. The prince had absolutely no idea what color was in Prince 15, because he's colorblind. But he knows 15, that he can see. And he takes 15, and he knew how to go within the lines. Most of us, after we turned seven, were able to stay within the lines. <laughs> and each time, this magnificent piece that really the artist was, was drawing the outline for was being produced. But at some point, the ego of it all, the applause of it all, the standing ovations that he was getting night after night got into his head. And the prince started believing that he was a great artist. After all, they're all saying that he's a great artist. After all, his pieces are hanging in the palace. And so he tells his instructor, no more of the, I don't need your help. I can do it on my own. And the teacher says, I don't think that's a good idea. I wouldn't do that if I were you. And he says, oh, let me do it. I can do it. And he gets up the next night. He has no drawing, no, no light color lines, no numbers. And he starts. And in the middle of it, he realizes just how lost he is. Because he absolutely has no idea of what color he's putting up there. And the result was terrible. And there was no applause, and there was no standing ovation. Why do I tell you this very strange story that never really happened? <laughs> because it's a metaphor to our own story. God gave us a mission. It's a complex world with complex human beings, a complex creation. Everything is complex. And he needs there to be a people that's going to keep this world focused. It's a tough task. And so he presents to us at Sinai the mission. This is what you need to do. 
and we're lost. Be a light unto the nations, inspire the world, be an eternal nation. These are great poetic words, but how? How do we do this? If left to our own, we're colorblind. We're going to get up there, we're going to make fools of ourselves. Now we have a message for the world, but we don't really know the message. And so God came up with paint by number. He gave us a very clear manual, the Torah. The Torah is our paint by number manual. Yeah, at times we get to see the benefits of each color. At times we're able to look at it and say, hey, it does look good. But even when we don't understand the different shades, we know that this manual works. And if we incorporate this manual into our lives and we follow the instructions of it, we end up with something beautiful. And so we're able to put something out and create this masterpiece. But if we decide that we want to be originals, that we want to do it all our own, we want to invent our own religion, invent our own traditions, or change the numbers, or change the color paints, it doesn't really work. And it doesn't really sell. And the next generation looks back at us and says, what's it for? They don't appreciate the value of it because we went off the numbers. We tried to do something of our own. And as we spoke about a number of weeks ago, by nature, the human being likes to find something new and exciting. The world of marketing knows this well by always putting that word new on a product. And by putting that word new, it gets your attention. Because new must mean it's better. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come up with it. Right? So Charmin will come up with the new paper towel, and you're going to buy it. And you'll pay four cents more because it's the new Charmin paper towel. And the same in every single product. The company knows that they'll make one minor change so they don't get in trouble with putting that word new there. And they'll flash in big yellow letters that word new because as you're passing by in the marketplace, you see that word new. And it gets your attention. Well, the same thing with everything in life. We are excited by newness. And the danger in that is that at times that which is new is not really good for us not healthy for us. There's a lot of new fads that come out that are not good for our children, not good for our grandchildren. Unless we give them an anchor, we give them something to hold on to. But if you look at the words, and if you pay attention, uh, if you take, a, if you, those of you that are here, you have the text in front of you, just look at chapter 11, verse 26. He says, Behold, I set before you today, and that word today is repeated all throughout, which means our job, our task as educators, as parents, as grandparents, as friends, is to keep Judaism relevant today, to make it exciting for today. You see, many would say we practice because it's what Bubby did, it's what Zaidi did, okay? There's something beautiful about nostalgia. Nostalgia is beautiful for a museum, but it really doesn't work in day-to-day -day life. Because you want me to live like Bubby and Zadie and great-grandfathers uh, great and great-well, they had outhouses as well, and we, still, we don't practice that, right? We've modernized ourselves to have something called a toilet that has plumbing, so we don't have to go to an outhouse in the middle of the night. We don't live the same lives that Bubby and Zadie, so you want to keep selling it to me. At some point, our children will say, that was good for them in Europe. It's not here in America. Our response has to be that Judaism was not just for Bubby and Zadie. Judaism is alive and exciting and important for us today, for this generation, for tomorrow's generation, for every generation. For it was given by God, and God's infinite in time. God lived before God existed, before there was a world, in early history, today, tomorrow, and therefore a Torah that comes from God is alive and exciting in every generation. Hayom, make the paint by number exciting today. That's our task. That's what we strive to do. If we simply say it's because of the ways of the past, yes, it may sell to some. But the way to really make Judaism alive today is Hayom. Picture it, that God is speaking to us today. 
that Sinai is happening today. That today we're on the shore of the Jordan River and Moses is speaking to us as we're able to see Israel just a little bit over the Jordan River. And he's telling us what is important for us today so that we're entering Israel today with that same excitement that our ancestors had. We're not commemorating what they did. Well, we're living it. That's the power of Moses' speech here. That's what Moses is trying to give over to us. Well, up to verse 29 of chapter 11. And he tells them, and it will be when the Lord your God will bring you to the land to which you come. Those, of, again, out there on, on social media that are watching it, just listen to the words. If you have a book of Deuteronomy uh, in your house, turn to chapter 11. It's verse 29. When the Lord your God will bring you to the land to which you come to possess it, that you shall place those blessings upon Mount Grizim and those cursing upon Mount Evo. So let me set the scene for you. Moses instructs them that when they enter the land, they should have an assembly. Everyone should come together and remind themselves of this mission statement and the blessings that God promised if they follow in the path of God and the consequences if they don't. And this is going to be a very critical moment in time because what changes drastically when we cross that Jordan River, when we enter into the land of Israel? They would have just experienced the fulfillment of the promise, right? The promise that was given to Abraham, that your descendants will enter the land. That promise passed on from Abraham to Isaac, passed on from Isaac to Jacob, passed on from Jacob to the 12 tribes, to Joseph, passed on to our ancestors as they were in Egypt. And then we were exiled in Egypt for 210 years, some 90 of those years in, in slavery. But we always had the promise that the land of Israel is going to be given to us. The land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Prezites, the Hivites, the Yivusites are going to be given to us. It's going to be our promised land. We held on to that promise. Then comes the Exodus. Then comes splitting of the sea. Then comes Mount Sinai. Then comes a 40-year detour in the wilderness. For 40 years, we wander in the wilderness. But what do we have? The promise. We're going into the land of Israel. Moses is speaking to them, literally, as I mentioned, within 39 days of his passing. What will happen right after his passing is Joshua will take the people and cross the Jordan. And they will be in the promised land. The promise will have been fulfilled, but there's a drastic change. Moses is no longer among them. Moses is not there. And that's going to be a very difficult transition for all of us that are standing there listening to Moses talk to us of what we should do when we enter because he won't be there. So he's giving over instructions what they are to do when he's no longer with them. And this is what this assembly should be. They should build an altar. They should bring an offering to God to show God the appreciation for this promise fulfilled and to commit themselves to holding true to the mission. This mission that Moses is going to be talking about, has been talking about, will continue talking about the Torah, the mitzvot. Moses understood that it would take some time for them to get used to being a nation without Moses. They had a comfort level with him. Yeah, they argued with him, they rebelled against him, but they had a comfort level with him. They knew this man cared for them, and they knew if they had problems, he was the go-to guy. And for some reason, this man, he had this connection up above. And that if we bothered him enough, and we quetched enough, and we complained enough, somehow he would get water out of a rock. <laughs> he can get manna from heaven. He can get protection from God in any battles we have. He had this staff that he used, right? There was a certain comfort level knowing Moses was there. But now they're going to need to rely on themselves. Yes, they're going to have a leader in Joshua, but Joshua and Moses are not the same. Not to take anything away from Joshua, but Joshua was a student of Moses. He wasn't Moses. Now you're going to rely on nature natural means. The manna is not falling from heaven once we step foot into the land of Israel. Find it, bake it, cook it, eat it yourself. 
Water is not coming forth from a rock the moment we enter into Israel. You're going to have to figure out ways to get water. And on a side note, Israel leads the world today in technology of how to get water. I mean, the California delegations are all flying to Israel to learn from Israel because of this shortage that we have. I know it rained a lot here, but we still have a tremendous shortage of water that we're facing, and we need Israeli technology to help us and guide us. Say again? Is there a delegation going in? Oh, they, Las Virginists just came back. A whole delegation of Las Virginists Water District wow. board members. Jay Lewitt, who's not here right now, usually comes every week as part of that board. They flew to Israel. They had lessons from Israel of how to, how to fa f deal with our crisis over here. Well, let's, let's get off the, the, the water shortage right now. Let's get back to, <laughs> let's get back to Moses here. I'll give you, give you this parable. So they're getting close, right? They're getting near Jordan, they're on the other side. Jordan River, by the way, is not a wide river, so if you're on the other side of the Jordan River, you can see over the borderline, right? You're seeing the promised land, it's there. And this mother says to her children, Tatala, do you see that? That's called a tree, it's a tree. See the tall thing that's coming out of the floor? That's a tree. And you see what's coming out of this, the long, the, the, the log? Those are branches. And then you see the leaves? That's the green things you're seeing. Those are called leaves. Because she's remembering this from her days in Egypt. Tatala, the little child, doesn't remember Egypt, doesn't know what a tree is. They've been in the desert for 40 years. So she's describing to him what happens. If you look closely, if you see the branch and you see the leaves, you'll also see these strange things hanging from them. That's a fruit. You see the orange one? That's called an orange. I thought it was actually called an orange back then, but just bear with me. <laughs> and what happens when you get close to that tree, you pull on that orange just a little bit, and it comes off. And then you peel away this cover of it, and inside there's something delicious. That tree, that's an apple tree. That tree, that's a pear tree. All those things, those are trees, and they give us food, and we're able to actually eat them. The little child turns to mommy and says, Mommy, Stop your fairy tales. <laughs> You're trying to convince me that that's a tree and that it comes from just this little seed? <laughs> You're trying to convince me that you can take a little seed and put it in the ground and that comes out of it? Like automatically it just grows something like that, something so huge, something with a fruit and a this and a peel and a color and an orange and an apple and there's red apples and green apples and gala apples and Macintosh apples. I exaggerate a little bit. <laughs> it's impossible to come out of a little seed. You're living in fairy tale land. I know how you get food. At 6 a.m., you go outside your tent and the food rains down from heaven. That's how you get food. Stop this nonsense about a little seed and it becomes a tree and you got branches and you have leaves and you have fruit. And the point I'm making with this parable is that for them living in the wilderness, what was miraculous to us was natural to them. If manna fell from heaven every single morning, that becomes your nature. And if I start telling you about trees and wheat and bread, you don't know what I'm talking about because... Every part of food that you put into your body during the 40 years in the wilderness came from up above. So you start thinking about the transition that this nation is going to go through and the shock to the system that they're going to have to go through as they enter into the promised land, aside from being spiritual and holy, which we're going to get to in chapter 12. But the mere change for them is going to be drastic. Because they're going to have to get used to something we know as nature. But they didn't know it yet. They have no idea 
of what life in the physical land was because in the wilderness, everything came from God. So everything is going to be different to them. What else will be different? Temptation will be different. They're going to be exposed. They've been protected in the wilderness. Now they're going to be exposed. They're going to see other societies. They're going to see other ways of life. They will have years of warfare ahead of them. Not all of the Canaanites will lay down and say, sure, it's your land. Some of them will, but not all of them. It's going to take years to settle all of the tribes in their particular assigned portions in the land of Israel. Building a new society in a new land is not an easy task. Imagine trying to start a country from scratch. It's never easy. It takes a lot of time. There are mistakes that are made. Think of trying to form a government from scratch. We can't even get through an election cycle in our country, right? Israel is struggling to get a government now for how many years, how many elections? Imagine starting from scratch. A credit to the founding fathers of this country and to the constitution of this country to come up with a system that has worked. But they're going to have to start a system. Interplay between the 12 tribes. This idea that we have in this country called the United States. Well, where do we get that from? Israel was really made up of 12, 12 different countries. Each tribe was a country of their own, but they were united as one nation, at least for some time until, until they had warfare between themselves. And so Moses is saying, at this very critical juncture, at panic time, you enter into the land and you realize all the changes. What I'm asking you to do is come together. I want a convention. A convention without me. But you need to have a convention. As I mentioned, bring offerings to God. I need you to remember that God is with you. That whatever goes on, God is there with you. That you're not alone. And the verse here, verse number 29, speaks of two mountains. So he's talking about a very specific geography. If you're familiar with the geography in Israel, the mountains that he's talking about is near the city of what is today Shechem, near Nabulus. It's today controlled by the Palestinian Authority. There's one place within Shechem that Jews still visit on a daily basis, basis and that's the tomb of Joseph, where Joseph is buried because Joseph is buried in Shechem. That's the area that Moses is calling now for this convention to take place. Within this area, he's talking about specifically, again, Moses was shown the land. He has a visual. He knows the map of the land. He hasn't been there, but he knows that map by heart. There's going to be a mountain, he says, that's called Mount Aval, and there's going to be a mountain called Mount Grizim. In between this mountain, there's going to be a valley. Two mountains and a valley. Half the nation will be on one mountain, half the nation on the other mountain, and in between the priests and the Levites in the valley. And the people would face one another, and they would listen as the priests and the Levites speak to them and repeat to them the Torah and the mitzvot. But there's going to be a difference between these two mountains. Because although they're right near one another, one of them was a very green mountain with many fruit trees. And the mountain of Aval, which was on the north side, was steep, was beer, and was bleak. And this picture, this visual that Moses is paying, playing out for them of these two mountains tell the story, the message that Moses wants them to hear. They both, both of these mountains rise from the same soil. Both were watered from the very same rainfall and dew. Both have the same ear and the same climate. Yet one mountain remains barren, while the other mountain is green with much vegetation. We can face the same external circumstances, and yet one will feel blessed, and the other will feel a life of difficulty. Says Moses, follow the pathway, follow the Torah, follow the mitzvot, and you're going to find yourself with green pastures. Drop it all, and drop your connection, you're going to find yourself with struggles. And so he's pleading with this generation, your, your ticket to finding a life with blessings is staying true to the mission statement that I'm presenting to you here today, 
not that I wrote, but that God gave over to you. That concludes chapter 11. Okay, we'll quickly read over the remaining few verses which I spoke out to you. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan, way behind in the direction of the sunset in the land of the Canaanites who dwell on the plain, opposite Gilgal, near the plains of Moreh, for you are crossing the Jordan to come to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving to you, and you shall possess it and dwell it, and you shall keep to perform all the statutes and ordinances that I'm setting before you today. Now begins chapter 12. As I mentioned to you, chapter 12 begins the second speech of Moses. Deuteronomy is divided into three parts. We just concluded part one. Does anyone remember when we started Deuteronomy? It was pre-COVID, <laughs> that's for sure. It was a long time ago. We just finished speech one. We now start on chapter 12. Chapter 12, we'll go through chapter 26. One long speech of Moses. Chapter 12, all the way through 26. It's the longest, the longest discourse in the Bible. The first theme of this long talk by Moses that begins in chapter 12 is the theme of purity. They're about, again, to enter the Holy Land, a land that is uniquely blessed by God, and that has to remain a holy land. The nation that were dwelling there up until this point were paganites, pagan nations, part of the Canaanite world. They were steeped in pagan idol worship, which included human sacrifice, which included infanticide, which included the slaughter of your firstborn child to their idols, which included sexual orgies. This was the practices of the Canaanite nations that they were about to enter. All for what they considered the pleasures of their gods, that their gods enjoyed this, or perhaps better said, it's what the priests of these gods believed or wanted for themselves, and so they painted it that this is what God wants. So just some understanding of what it is going on in the nation of the Canaanites as we're about to enter it. Now, when God instructed Abraham with the ten tests of faith, if you remember the story of Abraham, book of Genesis, it goes back some 30 years in our study group, but you remember one of those stories well, the story of the binding of Isaac. Okay? God comes to Abraham. This is the tenth and most difficult challenge. And he tells Abraham, I want you to take your son, your firstborn son, your only son, bring him to the mountain that I will show you, and bring him up as an offering to God. And Abraham does so, and Isaac is put up on the altar. And right before he's about to slaughter his own son, God calls out to him and says, it was just a test. <laughs> You see the ram caught in its horn in the, in the thickets and the bushes. That really is the offering, not a human being. Now, there's so many questions we can ask on that story, and we have, and we won't do it today. But that story is one of the monumental stories of faith, and yet many struggle with it as to why would ch God challenge him in such a type of test. And your questions are all valid questions, good questions, and we'll talk about it another time. But the point that I want to bring out today is the moment that God calls out to Abraham and says, stop, what God is making is a statement for all people of all time. And that is, stop. God does not want you to bring a human being as a sacrifice. That's the bold message. It needs to be known. Stop. Don't ever ever make the mistake that a God, and there's only one God, desires human blood to be spilled before him for any pleasure. Now they're going to actually be entering into a country that practices this. That's the way they worship. And to completely separate the Jewish faith from any of these pagan worships, they're going to be instructed that when they enter the land and take possession of it, they must rid the land of any such places of worship. Again, these are places of murder. These are places of idol worship. These are places of pagan ritual. And God doesn't want any remnant of these in the Holy Land. Why? Number one, because it's a holy land. And two, 
so that no one ever decides to return to such ritual. It needs to be destroyed. Eila hachukim vehameshpatim, verse 1. These are the statutes and the ordinances that you shall keep to perform in the land which the Lord God, God of your fathers, gives to you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy, verse 2, from all of the places where the nations that you shall possess worship their gods upon the lofty mountains and upon the hills and on under every lust tree. You shall tear down their altars, smash their monuments, burn their asherim with fire, cut down the graven images of their gods, and destroy their name from that place. God despises idol worship and he despises the murder of the human being for these idols. So though clearly this was an issue with early civilization, and some of the stories we have about our, our early start, of what begins Abraham on this mission, was his battle against idol worship. Who was Abraham's father? His name was Terach. What was Terach's line of business? He sold idols. That's how we began, a family that sold idols for a living. We were the Macy's of idol worship. We were the store. And Abraham fights against this. And he convinces his father of the silliness of idol worship. And he does battle with Nimrod, who was the king who made himself into a god. So we begin, our story begins with this battle against idol worship. Abraham's outreach to the world at that time was really focusing primarily on a battle against idol worship. He did it through chesed, he did it through kindness, he invited people in. He believed in friendship, but at the same time, in his friendship, he always preached against idol worship. So that's how we begin the battle with idol worship. We find reference to the stories of, to, in, in the stories of Exodus, to the idol worshiping ways of the Egyptians. In the story of the plagues, as we go through the portions that we're going through right now, we're finishing the plagues. The 10th plague is in this week's portion. Most of the plagues were in last week's portion or the portion before. As we go through the stories, the plagues were not just against the Egyptian people, but the plagues were also targeting the Egyptian idols. The reason it began with the plague of blood, which was turning the water of the Nile into blood, because the Nile was a god to the Egyptians. And God was demonstrating that your gods have no power, that your gods have no strength, that your gods can't help you. So even in the story of Exodus, we're always dealing with this battle against idol worship. And then we have the Ten Commandments, and specifically commandment number two. You shall not have, as it says, not have any strange gods or gods of others, as some translate it before me. It's important to know, as we read this and we think to ourselves, well, this is ancient history because it's not applicable to us because none of us bow to some Buddha this morning. We don't struggle with uh, bowing to stone. So this is, again, going back to a theme I touched upon earlier today about looking at it and saying it's just ancient talk. But is it? Even, even today, when the good majority of the world no longer bows to stone or to the sun or to the moon or slaughter their firstborn to a pagan god, the Ten Commandments are very applicable to us. You see, the Second Commandment doesn't say the words, don't bow to stone. It says, Elohim acherim, other gods or the gods of others. Because anything that you worship other than God is idol worship. So we tend to think of if I don't get down on my hands and knees before some, some pillar and bow to it, I'm not violating it. Look at the commandment again. To the gods of others, to that which people worship. Are you worshiping God or are you worshiping something other than God? If you look closely, the word is lo yiyah, you shall not have. The Torah is telling us that other gods don't have to be something that you actually worship, but rather something that you serve. If I change that word from worship to serve, it opens up a whole new list of categories 
of things that we can do that the Ten Commandments are telling us not to. If you look at it in the context of the first commandment and the second commandment, where the first commandment is, I am God, your God, who took you out of Egypt from the house of bondage and gave you freedom, the second commandment is telling us that you can't be free if you serve others. They lead you back to submission. They lead you to slavery. Don't go back there. You think about it. All the programs and the successful ones that help people with addictions, whether it's AA, alcoholic addictions, whatever it may be, those that incorporate a spiritual, godly aspect to them are more successful than those that don't. And it doesn't make a difference what religion. Doesn't have, doesn't, I'm not referring to Judaism necessarily. I'm talking about that there's a spiritual aspect to it. And the, the AA, clearly the meetings, have this aspect to it. With that there is a force above us. Call it what you want, but they're referring to God. I'll give you a simple example. I, like so many, I'm trying to diet. I try. I try hard. It's not easy. It was easy when you're young. You get old, it becomes uh, not so easy. I struggle with Mountain Dew. Those of you that know me for years know that Mountain Dew has been a weakness of mine since I was a child. I am proud to say, I feel like I'm at AA meeting here. My name is Moshe. I have been off Mountain Dew now for seven months. I have not tasted Mountain Dew. Yes, yes. Out there in the world of Zoom. Yes, seven months. There is Mountain Dew in my refrigerator in the office. Hector will tell you I have not touched it. Seven months. Seven months. I'm not telling you I'm not drinking anything else, but the Mountain Dew, seven months, I haven't touched it. I was about at five cans a day. It gave me energy as, woo, it's good. Anyone here love Mountain Dew? It's a great drink. It's like putting antifreeze into your body anytime you need it, and boom, you got energy again. If you work 14 hours a day, you need it, right? Coffee doesn't do it for me as much as Mountain Dew does, but I've been working it. It's hard. Dieting is very hard. Ah, oh, what Mountain Dew is? <laughs> so let me bring this point exactly to what you're saying. What if Mountain Dew wasn't kosher? I wouldn't have a struggle with it at all. And it, not, not at all. I wouldn't think twice. So if there's this beautiful piece of chocolate cake with whipped cream on top, right? And it's not kosher, there is not a, an ounce of strength that it takes for me to withstand eating it. It's just an automatic. The moment I see the OU that it's kosher, I want it. And now the battle begins. The chocolate cake starts talking to me and starts saying, hello, just a little piece, it won't hurt, just a little piece. You're hungry, you deserve it, you worked hard today, just take a little bit, and it, it just keeps going, the debate keeps going, right? Now, I don't understand. Why in one case, there's no battle at all, in the other case, it's a terrible struggle? In your unconscious, you've already established a pattern of behavior which unconscious to your ego self, but in fact, if it's not kosher, to move. It's off. It's exactly, it's off the chart. So somehow that which I have this addiction for, it's my own addiction, right? For, for sugary food and for sweet food, whatever it may be, or chocolate cake, it's not existing. And that's the, 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 the groups that deal with addictions that bring the higher power in. They know what they're doing because it actually works. The moment you can make something that this is something that God is asking you not to do, now you have additional forces helping you. Doesn't make it easy necessarily for everyone, but it definitely helps in all of our struggles and all of our battles. So your point that, that you make as far as idol worship, yeah, there, there's an aspect of that. The Talmud says this interesting thing. Whoever denies idolatry is as if he fulfilled the entire Torah. Think about that. You don't bow to idols, you fulfill the entire Torah. Now you're all saying, wow, I am just been elevated to be a tzaddik. I was just told... I keep the entire Torah because I don't bow to idols. Now, how, how, could, how could this be? Most, I would say 99.9% .9 of all Jews probably can make the claim that they don't serve idols. And the answer may be that the definition of idolatry could mean anything that becomes an end in itself. 
rather than a means to God. Yeah. In America, it's called materialism. Okay, that's exactly where we're going to go with this. Your pursuits in life need to lead to the spiritual. It needs to lead to God. Everything in life should be somehow God-focused, God-directed. I am God, your God, who took you out of Egypt, the house of bondage, because, and because I am, and because I exist, therefore you exist. And God's saying to us, you and I share this close relationship. Therefore, there should be no other focus in, in your life but God. And that doesn't mean a separation from the physical. It doesn't mean a separation completely from the material. But somehow it has to be that it's a means to bring me closer to God. That's its definition. Therefore, there should be no other, no other focus in your life. You get married because God wants us to get married. You have children because God wants us to have children. We earn a living because God wants us to earn a living. You're on a mission of God in every single thing that we do in, in life. And so where I'm going to go with this next week is we're going to start talking about life and the enjoyments we have in life. Are they idol worship or are they godly? Is it a means to God or is it a means to the end? This is the end in itself. And then we're going to understand why is God so strong about destroy the idols when you enter into the land of Israel. That's the first thing you need to focus on. And we'll move on throughout the rest of chapter 12. It's great having you back. I look forward to growing and getting the room packed to capacity as we used to have it pre-COVID. There is the delicious lunch for everyone. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Uh, announcements, Shh, forgot, 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 forgot. Uh, there's a flyer on your chair, the, 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 what's it, February 6th, someone tell me? Yes. February 6th is going to be a lecture, Monday evening, what time? I can't see from here. 7.30. 7.30, what am I going to be speaking about? <laughs> Whatever they said, that's what I'm going to do. February 6th at 7.30, I look forward to having you Monday night of that week. It's not this coming Monday night, it's a week from Monday night. And we look forward to having you spread the word to your friends as well. All right, we can sign off now, Jacob. Yep. Go ahead. The Jews, when they left Egypt, the first language they, they spoke Arabic. Hebrew. Hebrew. Hebrew, when they, I thought that only when they got to Israel, they spoke uh, Hebrew. It says that they